Prairie Dish, Texas, just outside Fort Worth. Uh, we're visiting a compressor station, it's called the Hog Branch Compressor Station. You can hear it roaring away. Uh, when we look at coal seam gas, shale gas, and what a gas industry in the United States looks like. What's your impression, bro? Well, what people back home have to understand is that you, know, you can smell this, you can certainly hear it, there's huge noise in the background here. This is taking place in a semi-urban, semi-rural uh, situation. In Queensland, this sort of infrastructure will be everywhere as it is here, uh, and it will be in rural, completely rural uh, environments. So we'll be industrializing the landscape, turning it into a noisy, smelly landscape just like it's been here. Well everyone, another compressor station. It absolutely reeks here. It's obviously contaminating the atmosphere. Pollution just being pumped up. It stinks. It's absolutely giving me a headache. Uh, just over here, we've got uh, cattle properties, farming, and on the hill here, a landowner forced out. He got so sick, he couldn't work, lost his job, lost his house, lost his farm. Absolutely outrageous, just because the gas industry set up across the road from him. This is what it's about, an industrialisation of the landscape, pollution on a monumental scale. It's an absolute disaster. It's disgusting. One of the key complaints when it comes to coal seam gas is the noise, an industrialised landscape. I don't know how these people are living here. Listen to that noise. That's all because they're fracking just 100 metres behind these houses. How these people live here, how they can survive in this industrialised landscape is beyond me. G'day everyone, I'm here with Gary Hogan. He's the president of the North Central Texas Community Alliance. We're here in uh, Chapel Creek, uh, outside Fort Worth. Uh, Gary's got a bit to tell us uh, in terms of a warning about uh, unconventional gas in an urban environment. Gary? Well, what I'd, li what I'd like to, trans uh, to communicate to the people of Australia is what you're going to be coming up against is everything that we've come up against. And that's everything from the initial disturbance of, of natural gas drilling, especially if it's in an urban center community, but also in the rural communities. The environmental impacts and the, and the ethics of this business are that they really don't care about the business, all they, about the people. All they care about is what's under this ground, what they can take from us, what they can get out from under you. Everything else is superfluous to what they can take from you. So Gary, we've got two wells here, but uh, what does that mean in terms of truck movements and how many wells are there in this suburb? Well, from where we're standing right now, uh, there are nine pad sites within a mile of where we're standing. And on those well pad sites, the nine pad sites, there are 24 active natural gas wells. Yep. So the truck traffic that services all these wells around our neighborhood, are, uh, the truck traffic can be tremendous. Just as we were standing here a little while ago, one of the trucks went by. This well site is serviced at least by two truck visits a day. And so they're all the well sites around us. Road impacts. You know, these, these roads were not made for 80,000, 100,000 pound water trucks. So it's an industrialization of your suburb? It's an industrialization of the urban environment, yes, and neighborhoods. And like these homes behind us here are about 400 feet from the two well bores. Yep. And in the city of Fort Worth, they're actually allowed as close as 200 feet from some of the homes. So we've done it really crazy. I agree. Thanks, Gary. Thank That'd you. Be great, mate. G'day everyone, we're on our US frack finding tour. We're in Fort Worth, Texas, I'm having a look at gas wells, unconventional gas in the heart of this massive city. I'm with Don Young, he's a community activist and uh, uh, organiser campaigning against gas 
in this state. Don, what are we looking at here? Well, we're, we're standing right in the middle of the cultural district of Fort Worth, which is where some world-class museums are. The Kimball Art Museum, the Amy Carter Museum, and others are just uh, literally less than a half a mile from here. And in, in this area where thousands of people live, uh, for instance, in this apartment block behind us, uh, Chesapeake Energy has installed this approximately five-acre gas pad site, natural gas drilling pad site, a couple of years ago. It was very controversial at the time because they were just building these apartments and there were people concerned about the safety of putting something that's dangerous so close to where so many people live, not to mention in the, in the heart of the cultural district, which is a, a source of pride for people who live here. And we've now got how many wells in the Fort Worth area now? There's a little less than 2,000 within the city limits of Fort Worth, and Fort Worth is uh, inside the Barnett Shell, where there are roughly 15 to 20,000 gas wells. It's absolutely incredible. This is what Sydney faces. This is what uh, the future of New South Wales and Queensland will be if we don't say no to coal seam gas and unconventional gas. Thanks, Don. what we're talking about. We're in the heart of Fort Worth in Texas. This is an industrialised urban environment. That is a massive frackery and that is a bank working away here. What we've got is trucks, vehicular movements, dust, pollution. We've just seen a truck with reduced water leave here. It's completely outrageous and this is what we're talking about when it comes to unconventional gas. Hey everyone, I'm in Pavilion, Wyoming, on the property of John Fenton, a farmer in this district. This is a condensate tank. Every gas well in this district, and there's 200 of them, has one of these. The, new, the US EPA has found that the water here, the groundwater here, has been polluted. They've found volatiles and other toxic chemicals in the groundwater here. Just standing here now, I can smell the fugitive emissions coming out of there. This is a dirty polluting industry. It's polluting this countryside. It's terrible. G'day everyone. I'm on Indian Ridge in Pavilion, Wyoming. This is a gas wellhead and behind me there's another one every 300 metres across this productive farmland. John Fenton has told us that people in his area are getting sick from drinking contaminated water and this is the cause. The industry is now supplying this community with safe drinking water. They have to truck that water in because the water here is no longer safe to drink. Call coal seam gas. We call coal bed methane, or CBM for short. We're in a the coal bed methane bust here because the price of natural gas has plunged into the toilet. So all the development is most for the most part shut in. But when in its heyday, there's still some operating wells, and I've given people the total figures. They're big, but. We had uh, every year for a decade probably 500 miles a year of these three-phase power lines behind you. Go, these are all new, all over the country, strung like uh, you know network web, of spider web, uh, of power lines that had to be constructed uh, to support the energy required to pump the water out to get the gas. They built a new coal-fired power plant. Uh, recently just to, and and they had three methane fired smaller gas plants just to power up this industry um, and the ind and the energy needs to get that energy 
then all around us there's miles and miles of pipelines. Then we have thousands of these uh, big pits and reservoirs that were built and constructed. Uh, and if you, you can use my binoculars if you want, where that tire tank is and that rock will be where they would discharge the water from several wells, fill up this uh, pit, and most of the water would, you know, they're hoping to seep, seep in. Uh, there's another pit on the other side. They have multiples of these pits that sometimes sit above a drainage, uh, and they would uh, <coughs> pump this water out and discharge it, and it would go downstream and cause a lot of problems for landowners downstream in terms of ruining their uh, soil and vegetation and land. What kind of regulation do they have about that? Uh, well, pretty much they tried to put parameters on the discharge, um, but they would never put the right parameters on. Basically what we wanted to say is no, no surface discharge. You've got to re-inject it. Uh, and re-inject it back into our, our freshwater aquifer you're taking it out of and go in a stage development because that water is a precious resource and you're, you're causing two problems. One, you're pumping it out and people, dozens and dozens of farm family, ranch families here lost their water wells because they pumped it dry by, well, the aquifer dropped 600 feet here. And then the double whammy is it has just enough sodium it's high enough in the sodium and salt and we have clay soils that you dump it on the surface and it turns our soils to like a cement like a hard pan you can't grow anything then the only thing that grows is something that's salt tolerant and weeds Jill, but how do you feel about that produced water because it's not just the saline aquifer water there's also the drilling fluids and frac fluids and all well that. they don't because these wells here in this basin are in freshwater aquifers they n say they never fracked with any chemicals because these are drinking water aquifers in use by everybody in this basin and the city of Gillette and so they would frack with fresh water the same uh, fresh water and uh, sand. Um, Are you confident they did that? Uh, no, because I found some documents where they were using some acids and some biocides. I don't know what was in those, but and I know that some people, after they would frack near their their home water well, it would turn black for a while just from just from breaking up the coal, and the coal would come in it and. Um, I think for the most part, they, I don't think they used the real serious chemicals because we would have known real damn fast. And because they're, when they started the development here, there had been a recent big suit in Alabama over uh, development of freshwater aquifers there that threatened uh, water. So they knew they had to be careful about uh, how they completed those wells. But they didn't end up re-injecting, they just ended no, up just they ended up, and it out I mean 75,000 acre feet a year is how much water at the heyday they're pumping out and wasting. Uh, they have pumped out a total over the 15 ye last 15 years uh, about 800,000 acre feet of water here in this basin. And just to give people a comparison. One acre foot is enough for a family of four for an entire year. So 800,000 acre feet would supply a lot of water for a lot of families for a long time. I mean the, the entire state of Wyoming for probably 20 years or something. So How many, uh, how many wells in the district? In this basin there have been uh, around 26 or 20, around somewhere between 25 and 30,000 wells drilled. There are now around probably only 7,000 wells producing. Uh, you know, there's probably around 12 or 13,000 shut in, idled because of the price of natural gas. There's another several thousand that are done, not going to produce anymore. The life of the wells in this basin are very short lived. They hit their peak at three or four years and then they go down and they're done by seven to ten years. 
it's not like the San Juan Basin in Colorado where those coal bed methane wells might last 20 years. So this is the Powder River, one of the last free-flowing prairie rivers in the United States. And on the wall behind it, you can see the salt. It's been contaminated. All those holding ponds discharging the produced water is ending up down here and depositing all that salt on the wall there. You can see it. Imagine that in the Namoy, the Clarence, the Nepean, the Condamine, it would be an absolute disaster. This is a warning from the United States to Australia about what big gas will do to our precious water. One of the major issues with the unconventional gas industry is what they're going to do with the billions of litres of toxic salty water they produce. One of the things they've said is that they will find a complementary use, such as irrigating lucid. And behind me, they've started that, and it looks quite good, until you find out that that's not lucid, it's ragweed, a useless crop that grows on salty ground. So this is just more industry spin, it's all about PR, and nothing to do with agriculture or a sustainable future for Australia. <laughs> Bill and Marg West's wheat property just outside Gillette in the Powder River Basin in Wyoming. Behind me is a coal seam gas produced water pond. There's dozens of these on this property. The industry has put a hundred wells here and what it's meant is vast quantities of water have been pumped into these ponds and pumped into the landscape and what it's led to is a reduction in productivity in the Lucent Flats. It's killed off hundreds if not thousands of cottonwood trees and it's ruined the soil. What we've got is sodic saline, saline water going into the soil and it's made the soil hard and unproductive. This is the outcome of coal seam gas, reduced productivity and using the environment as a drain. Right here in the D.C. area, Maryland and Virginia, Mr. Mike Tidwell. Demand change. We are here to demand change. We need to work locally. Good day, everyone. I'm here Governor outside Cuomo. Congress in we Washington, D.C. at the National Day of Fracking. Behind me you can hear speakers and a huge crowd from across the United States. States from California to Maine, we Texas, to all here represented, calling on now. Barack Obama and the Congress to act to rein in a gas industry that's destroying land, destroying water and destroying communities. This is what's happening in the United States. I'll be bringing what I learn here back to Australia and informing our parliament and activating our campaign.
have to go to your township and get a permit. And then they have to get a bond. And that's how you trap them into paying for the damage. Even though legally they have to pay for it anyway. G'day everyone, I'm outside at Williamsport in Pennsylvania. This is shale gas. Behind me, you can hear it roaring away, venting volatile, toxic compounds to the atmosphere. You can see it there. For the naked eye, it's just there. Venting into the atmosphere, who knows what. Farms around here, houses around here. This is just a couple wells. There's 4,000 of these already in this region, and tens of thousands planned. This is what an industrialised landscape means. It means pollution from water, pollution to the atmosphere, uh, externalising pollution at the cost of us and our environment, and also in terms of methane, one of the most powerful greenhouse gases. This is not a clean industry. This is not an industry that's an alternative to coal and fossil fuels. What it means is it risking more climate change through another fossil fuel. It's not a transition. What we need to do is move away from coal and gas isn't the answer. We need renewables so we aren't doing this to our landscape. I'm with Kevin Heatley. Uh, he's part of the Responsible Drilling Alliance, a community action group fighting the shale gas industry in his district. Behind me, there's uh, shale gas wells and you can hear that roaring, that venting. That's venting volatiles into the atmosphere. Kevin, what is, what's your impression of the gas industry? What's it meant for the ecology, the environment, and the community here? Yeah, I'm glad you're here today because this is, the Responsible Drilling Alliance is actually an oxymoron. There is no such thing as a responsible drilling in this industry. This extraction of this fossil fuel is, it got dramatic impacts to the landscape ecology, dramatic impacts to the community, and global consequences if we don't leave it in the ground. But you can see right around you right now what we're dealing with. We've got about a five acre pad, which is standard for what they're doing in Pennsylvania. They've got these five acre pads. They're putting these pads approximately every mile. That's their ideal configuration is about every mile they want to put these pads. Imagine putting a parking lot. Doesn't matter if it's a Walmart parking lot or whatever. It's a supermarket parking lot. A parking lot every mile throughout any landscape. Doesn't matter if it's a, you know, we have a, we have brand new homes over here with people with children. They're right next to an industrial site. It doesn't matter if it's an agricultural field. It doesn't matter if it's a forest. You are going to change fundamentally the ecology and particularly the hydrology, the surface hydrology. Never mind if these guys never spill a single drop of poisonous chemical. Which anybody believe that? Anybody going to believe that? That they're not going to do anything like that? They're creating parking lots with excessive truck traffic. Just the runoff from the trucks themselves are going to cause surface contamination. But say they don't even do that. Say they're super anal retentive and they keep everything really clean and pristine. You are going to have problems with changing the surface hydrology because you're putting impermeable surfaces. Now remember, you've got the pad. Average is about five acres in Pennsylvania. It's impermeable surface. It's stone, a stone base. You've got the access roads. These guys got to get heavy truck traffic back and forth. You've got pipeline right-of-ways because it's all got to be connected with pipelines. And these pipeline right-of-ways in Pennsylvania, we have one of the largest contiguous forests in the eastern United States. And by that, I mean forest that's connected to forest. Phenomenal resource. These guys are slicing and dicing it overnight. And it is not going back into forest. It's going back into grass. That changes the runoff, the way the, the soil responds, the way when there's a rain event, the way the runoff responds because the forest is a sponge and they're slicing up this sponge and what happens is that instead of the moisture in a rainfall event being soaked into the forest and the vegetation and held in that soil and gradually released to the streams, now it hits a well pad, hits an access road or it hits a pipeline right away and boom, it's right into the stream and you get that what they call a plug flow of volume and God forbid you live downstream because not only are you going to have excessive volume that's going to hit you that the forest was protecting you from, now you've got all the associated surface contamination. And there is contamination. Oh, absolutely. There? How could there not be? Yep. I mean, even if you don't spill it, just the runoff from the trucks themselves is going to be contaminated. Well, I would we can drink. see here, we can oh, see yeah. here, it looks like they've been filling the tankers and we've seen dozens and dozens of them just in this little drive up here. And it looks like they've had spills out of these holding ponds, out of the tankers, out of the trucks, 
into the landscape. Is that what's happening in it's, it's chronic. It is chronic. And what's really egregious is that the regulatory agencies are so, I shouldn't say inept, but I'm going to say it. They're inept at doing their job. They don't have the resources. They're in bed with the industry. Our government has has basically given this industry a free ride and subsidized this industry. And why they're doing it, I don't even want to speculate, but it's definitely the money has influenced the decision making because it's not in the best interest of the community because the costs, the costs of doing business, what they call the externality costs, are not being put into the cost of the gas production. So they're privatizing the profit and they're socializing the cost. So these poor people who had beautiful properties right across the street in the middle of the woods are now living next to an industrial site with this 24 7 you hear that venting you hear that they're breathing that they're breathing that material their babies are breathing that material and this is across pennsylvania this is ubiquitous across pennsylvania pennsylvania has become the joke where people from south africa from france from bulgaria from from really progressive places like Australia are coming to see what happens in Pennsylvania. And we've lost Pennsylvania. I'm moving out the first chance I get, I will be leaving Pennsylvania. And I raised my sons here and it makes me sick because I hiked these woods, I moved here because of this resource, a world-class sustainable resource that could have generated an income for these communities if managed properly for generations and they're thrown away overnight. So when the gas industry comes to you and they say, we're gonna bring in these many jobs, number one, they're temporary jobs. Number two, ask them how much is gonna be lost. What is the other side of the balance sheet? Yeah, they and they all kinds of stuff. And it's, it's, it's not near as good a forest as it was when the Indians left it. Okay, this is an incredibly beautiful. G'day everyone. I'm in Pennsylvania in the United States. Behind me, a beautiful oak and hemlock forest. And this is the destruction caused by the gas industry. Huge swathes of the countryside destroyed for the pipelines. It's not often considered when we think about the impacts of the gas industry. And it's very important when we think about the precious areas we have left in New South Wales, like the Pilliga. This is what we will visit upon those areas. The vegetation destroyed, huge areas mown down, the animals, the habitat absolutely ruined for a gas industry that will only last 20 to 30 years. Do we think this sort of destruction is worth the short term benefits of gas? Um, my name is Morgan Myers, I'm from central Pennsylvania and um, I was home visiting from college and I was out hiking in the woods up on Eagleton Mountain in Renova near uh, in Clinton County and my friend and I came across this well pad and I hadn't heard of fracking or anything like that before and I grew up in these woods so I it was like nothing I had ever seen before it just doesn't it's not the woods I remembered and then when we got there they were flaring off the natural gas and you could feel the heat from it before you even saw the flare for like a mile back we could hear it and feel the heat and then after I saw it I just I knew it was big I knew I didn't really understand what was happening but I knew my community was being changed dramatically and from there I ended up talking to the Responsible Drilling Alliance and I've been trying to educate myself as best I can. So you're seeing this tremendous devastation in the forest. G'day everyone. I'm on a mountaintop in the middle of Pennsylvania in the United States. Behind me, a huge water storage holding facility. This is what awaits the northern rivers of New South Wales, Camden and western New South Wales. Those areas threatened by coal seam gas. Because be it shale gas, coal seam gas or tight sands, this industry must use vast amounts of water in the fracking process and then it produces salty, briny, toxic water and it has to be stored in facilities just like this. Yeah.